So yeah, the title of my talk is Computer Vision and Machine Learning for Environmental Monitoring. And um, to set the background a bit, if you're a computer scientist, um, this is an application talk. So this will be a talk about uh, applications of things that you might consider relatively clear. If you're more an environmental scientist, this is a computer science talk. So it will not be going around in the field and, and really collecting ground samples, but more about computational technology to scale and map. So the topic is basically applications of machine learning. Um, for image analysis, image maybe in a slightly broader view to extract environmental information. So we have some sort of image-like data. This doesn't have to be an RGB photo. Could also be a multi-spectral image or even a hyperspectral image. It could be some sort of light LIDAR scan. So a sort of a range image. And this image-like observation data goes into some statistically motivated modeling machinery. So we are not trying to apply first principles physics, but to statistically in a data-driven manner, find some patterns and predict some information that is environmentally relevant in one way or the other. So it's used uh, for environmental further applications. Um, for our purposes, you know, there's a, there's a lot of wording, a lot of hype around this topic at the moment. So for our purposes, I'm not gonna make a difference here. This is not gonna be a philosophical talk about what is what. So machine learning is sort of the Statistical analysis or mining part of data science. It's also the same as basically large scale statistical prediction. And it's also what some people call statistical AI. So not symbolic minded, but data driven. For me, this is for the moment all the same. And I'm aware that there are subtle differences, but they won't matter for today. So why would we apply um, machine learning for this application? Um, some people claim the uh, it's the fourth pillar of scientific method, the new big addition. So beyond experimental, theoretical and simulation science, data science, I leave that discussion again to other more conceptually minded people. One thing's for sure, it is the fourth pillar of engineering. So as a purely engineering tool, it has um, made a big impact over the last years. You're aware of all these examples here, and I'm, I'm sorry that all of them are related to Google. This is pure coincidence. I'm not employed or paid by Google, but um, among others, voice recognition, lang natural language processing. So for example, the voice assistance in, in mobile devices, for example, the visual perception in autonomous cars, and of course, also the assessment of game positions in not only Go, but maybe for Russians more suitable also chess. So engines like uh, AlphaZero and Lila, and recently actually also the strongest uh, chess engine in the world, Stockfish, are using neural networks to um, evaluate positions. So basically to predict the probability that you will win if you play optimally from here. So, to narrow it down a bit, since machine learning is a big thing, we will, I will here sort of uh, reduce it to supervised machine learning. So essentially regression, if the thing you want to know consists of continuous values or classification, if the thing you want to know consists of nominal labels, of class labels, unordered in some sense. So anything else that goes towards unsupervised or symbolic learning, we leave out too, and that basically leaves us with regression classification, of course, in a structured sense. So not only outputting scalars, so but outputting sort of ordered quantities, images, whatever. And for the application, I guess the computer scientists find this trivial, but uh, let me just repeat that it is not a magic wand. It is a very strong and very good engineering tool um, with a beautiful theory as well. But machine learning also has its uh, sort of a sweet spot. And it's good if your main goal is a predictive relation where you don't have a good analytical model. So if you have a very good analytical model, if you can understand and describe the first principles physics of something with little bias and so that it's computationally tractable, there's actually no point for machine learning because that other model will also work. And if you want to understand and um, model in a sort of you know low complexity uh, intuitive 
um, differential way the behavior. So if you want to make inferences about the mechanisms behind something, then machine learning can be good in the exploratory phase, but its real strength is the predictive relation. So that relation might not be particularly useful to understand what's going on, but it will mean, make very good predictions for data points that you have not seen. And that is also important. You know, if you go to the doctor, in a sense, it's more important that he gives you the right cure that, 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 than that he really understands what's wrong with you. Another thing is to keep in mind, there's no magic, right? There must be a relation. If there isn't a statistical relation, there's nothing to discover, but many relations that are interesting are actually intractable or very hard to see. So that's where it's very good in uncovering those. Um, it's very good at finding those correlations between data that are not obvious, that are not expected. Um, and the funny thing, and some people have called that the unreason eff eff unreasonable effectiveness of data is this increasing statistical strength. So if there is a correlation that you can use, that, so the inputs tell you something useful about the outputs, you will eventually find it if you throw enough data at it. Of course, this is more of a conceptual thing because what enough data is, is a different question, but with enough data, you will usually see the patterns and that is why this works so amazingly well. Also important for me, this is just a message uh, that I like to put more to the computer scientists, to those who are already machine learning converts, machine learning, or to the younger students, machine learning is an entire scientific field, right? It is not just your favorite neural network model. There are a lot of things um, that have their place and they're useful and that are not intrinsically worse just because they're a bit older or because they have a different application than the one that you're interested in. So yes, deep networks and especially deep convolutional networks are of course you know the latest and greatest for many patterns but that's because the patterns that we're talking about especially image video audio language are actually convolution in nature right they are sort of shift invariant local patterns that matter so of course convolution is good the mathematics behind that is still clear recursive things are good for time series obviously as stuff develops and you don't know how long you have variable length if you need uncertainty, and that's very important in many application sciences, so you want to put error bars on your prediction and tell people how much they can trust them, then of course you have to go to more Gaussian or Bayesian minded methods. And also the good old shallow methods like just logistic regression and HMMs and so on are really good because there are situations where you don't need a huge context, where you don't need to extract features and correlations over, within the data over a huge area, but just every data point is already well described, it has all the important information in it, and you are going to map it to something with just a nonlinear function, then you actually don't need more. So it's important for me to keep this all sort of uh, in the back of the head. For this talk, um, now we're going more to my specific uh, research. I want to introduce one particular data source to you in advance because it comes multiple times and it might not be familiar uh, to everybody. Um, satellite images, and in this uh, particular case, satellite images from a European satellite constellation called Sentinel-2. So this is Sentinel-2, obviously in a rendering, nobody went to take a photo in space. And that has a camera built in. So it's a normal camera that images with a lot of, uh, with different filters in a lot of optical wavelengths. So it has sort of a blue that is already down towards the uh, ultraviolet, a normal blue channel, green channel, yellow, uh, reddish channel, and then come a number of infrared channels, some of them with very narrow bands that's on the ramp, it, just after the visible towards one micrometer wavelength because there the vegetation can be sensed very well, also has a broadband there, and then it goes all the way to short wave infrared, so more than uh, two micron. All in all, it has 13 bands. They don't have all the same resolution that has to do with signal to noise ratio and, and data ratio and what you can do. And it flies around the earth. And the ni nice thing about this one is it flies around the earth in a predictable pattern. So it's not steered to certain locations like a commercial satellite or a spy satellite for that matter, but it just covers the whole earth with its orbit again and again. And every five days it comes over the same location. So you get very nice complete coverage of every land surface with a regular sampling interval. On the right, you see a picture. In this case, it's of Paris. Um, and it looks very good. You, of course, have to be aware of the limitations. So that's when you zoom in onto the Arc de Triomphe. And the pixel size is 10 by 10 meter on the ground. So 
Um, this is also a bit different from close range images. You actually don't see a lot of objects. Most of the objects that an object detector in a normal vision application would see as in a whole image are actually within one pixel. So things are a bit different. But that's one of our main workhorses, this optical satellite. So I presented. There will be some others mentioned too. Good. Now let's come to a first application, our environmental computer vision, if you will, and that's tree density. So I'll, I'll start with the game. Maybe now everybody can use the chat function. Um, this is an image taken with Sentinel. So again, one pixel is 10 meters side length um, from California. Obviously, I'm cheating a bit. I'm only showing you three of the 13 channels because otherwise I couldn't render it for your eyes. And now the question is, how many cars can you see? Who can guess the number of cars in this image? Anybody willing to throw a number? Maybe 10 or uh, just easy. <laughs> um, okay, one. Oh. 40. Don't, don't forget, one pixel is 40 by is 10 by 10 meters, so that's more than a car. Um. Okay, so let's give you the resolution. That's what our algorithm says. It says 4,100 cars. In reality, they're 4,300. So I got a high resolution image for that particular one. Mind you, the reason why there are so many cars is that that is after the diesel scandal when VW had to call back a lot of cars because they were actually not uh, producing the exhaust uh, values that they had promised and they had to pull them somewhere. They basically just had to store them somewhere that got all those cars back from the dealers and customers and that's the airfield where they did that in California. So, um, of course, we're not really interested in the cars in reality. So here's the environmental application, which is to count trees. For example, here, this is a photo of southern Spain, part of Andalusia, and you want to count, for example, the olive trees. There really are trees. So here's again the magnification. And here's then if you scale this up even more. So that is a map of the density of oil palms for all of Southeast Asia. So these two countries, Malaysia and Indonesia, they actually produce more than 80% of the palm oil in the world. And as you know, that is unfortunately also related to things like illegal deforestation and so on. So it's important to monitor that reasonably well. And so we made this map. Uh, you don't see it because there's only one map. This is, these are actually, you know, literally billions of pixels because uh, even if 10 by 10 meter is not much, but uh, it's more than a thousand kilometers that you see in front of you. So then it gets big again. So this is one zoom into the map to show you about the level of detail. You actually see the access roads between the plantations, but you don't see the individual trees. And there were some technical tricks involved to make this map like active learning because you need to label the right training data and so on. You can then, of course, compare and see whether this fits the ground truth and whether it does good predictions. And you can, at the bottom, you see the change over time. So you can do this repeatedly and you see how the plantation areas change. It's not only getting more and eating rainforest, it also goes in the opposite direction. They cut down some trees to replant them because at some age, they, of course, uh, don't give you enough fruits anymore, or they might be hit by a hurricane, which also happens in those world regions. So just some applications. So how do we do it? Obviously, I'm cheating a bit if I say we count trees. We cannot count because a tree is smaller than a pixel. Um, the yellow boxes here are the sentinel pixels. Um, so what we actually do is we estimate density. We put a, we output a fractional density for, for the pixel and say we think in this pixel there are 2.3 trees. And we put on another thing, which is a semantic label. Um, that's the green thing that basically says, is this a palm tree area at all or not. So this is a two-class segmentation or classification. You could, of course, argue you don't need it. That's white is just density zero, but it helps to sharpen the distribution if you explicitly say there shouldn't be a lot of small numbers, but either there's something there or not. So the method is actually, as I said, a, a neural network, pretty standard one, sort of ResNet blocks um, stacked on top of each other, um, so convolution, and, but in a residual way. So you basically just learn weights to make an additive correction to your input and gradually transform your input. You stack many of those that trains very well because with these shortcuts to the additive connections, you have a better gradient flow because you jump over some layers. 
And we have two branches, so we supervise it both by semantics, by saying here's a label that says, is there palm trees at all or not? And if there are palm trees, here is the fractional density. And we put those things, we output both of those things, and you can combine them, but you really only want mainly the density. And why do we do it this way? Um, well, the, the problem is how do you train that, right? Uh, you can only do this density, but you can't measure it. It's very hard to get that in large numbers. And there's a little trick that you can find some areas where there are higher resolution images, even just by looking at Google Maps, but that's not allowed. You're not allowed to use the product to derive other products. So you have, just have to get some others. And there you can mark the individual trees because they're visible. So we, we put an intermediate layer for the training data where we have such a high resolution that we can mark some by hand and then run a conventional object detector to scale it up. So you mark a couple of hundred trees and then you train some standard computer vision object detector. And if you tell it hard enough by many training iterations that it's no longer looking for pedestrians or cats, but it's looking for olive trees then, or for palm trees, then eventually it will do that. And you can run that at large scale. It will make a mistake, but the mistake is small enough that you can compute the density and you know just averaging will um, destroy the inference of those mistakes and it's still usable training data for the next level. A few considerations. So it's not straightforward application. Uh, this is something I, I preach a lot. Even if those modern machine learning architectures, ResNet, DenseNet, Transformers, when you name them, are really, really good and you got implementations, you can go to GitHub and download PyTorch code that is wonderfully well done, better than I could do it. But nevertheless, um, you should think before you use a certain architecture and you should adapt it properly. An important thing when working with those satellite images is, for example, that uh, the scale. So on the right, you see a picture of an image from some standard image benchmark. I don't know, maybe it's Microsoft Coco or Pascal Visual Objects, I don't know. At the bottom, you see an airplane in a Sentinel image that's from Paris Airport. And you already see that there is a bit of a difference in resolution. So while downscaling, repeated pooling things together and making the receptive field big this way is a very good idea in a normal computer vision system on a robot or a car. So that's why uh, Deep Lab, the, one of the standard uh, architectures from Google for this does that or from Facebook. So it aggregates and makes the image coarser. And then you get some activation maps like at the top. So you see that much of the structure is lost. This is from our palm trees. And at the bottom, you see what we do. So we actually don't downscale at all because it's not a good idea if you already have only five picks for an object to downscale two more times by a factor of two because then it's gone, right? So you should actually, for example, be careful that your context comes from somewhere else. If you still need context, there are actually ways of doing it. You just go deeper so that you stack more convolutions and then that will eventually also aggregate context. So you might, of course, ask, why does this work? What's the relation? I mean, if you think about it, it's a relatively easy problem. That's why I chose it for the introduction. Because the background is sort of observable. You see what things without the trees look like in the image, and you see what things with the trees look like. So it's a nice discriminative problem. And the fraction of pixels covered by this particular spectral response that you that is indicative of your objects can therefore be learned. The objects all have similar size, so conversion to density is straightforward, and so on. Um, there are actually people who try to do similar things, like estimating at least uh, some if vegetation properties, if not density, um, directly with radiative transfer models. So you could try to trace the sun radiation through the atmosphere and back with some physics model. Um, it turns out that this is extremely complicated because of the reflection behavior of natural materials, because of multi-reflections and so on. It just gets very hard, although it's interesting. Okay, so let's go to another related problem. This was more like the introductory teaser because of the nice example with guessing the cars. So tree height, can we estimate the height of trees? Now the sentinel is a monocular view, so geometrically we can't. There is no triangulation, there is no range measurement, so we can actually not measure how high the trees are. We don't have a physical signal. But since we don't have this large scale stereo coverage and we want to know how high the trees are, we still try. So we take the sentinel image, which has 13 bands as an input, and we put it through some neural network. And then we want an output like this in the middle. So this is a map of how high is the canopy at every pixel. We, of course, again, need some ground truth for supervised learning, which in this case 
is locally people measure this with a real measurement device uh, with airborne LIDAR. So that's a laser scanner. That's a, basically an airplane with a laser pointing downwards that you can scan left and right. That laser shoots down a very short pulse. And then you have an optical detector that records when that pulse comes back. And since it's reflected by the objects on the ground, if you know the speed of light, you can measure the range. And then you get a polar coordinate. And in this way, you can measure the height because part of that light is reflected at the top of the trees and then a little bit in between, and then the last bit from the bottom. And therefore, between the first and last answer of that LIDAR, basically, um, you get a range measurement via the speed of light. We'll come back to that later. And now the question is, can we get monocular images and infer the height? It sounds like it's ill post, right? It, it should actually not work. Um, but we tried, um, and it does work. So the idea is it's, again, a deep network that does regression, no strident convolution, no down sampling, so a lot of, lay a lot of layers, um, 36 or 38, or depending on how you count. There are some tricks, again, technical tricks that are well known, but that are important. For example, separable convolution. So the convolutions in a 2D conv net, you should be aware, are three-dimensional, because you go over all the channels. So you actually have a three-dimensional convolution kernel. The parameter count goes up, but people have figured out that it's actually not necessary. You can separate the spatial from the spectral dimension quite well. So you have a 2D convolution only in space, x, y, and then you have a 1D convolution that sort of merges, linearly combines the responses across different spectral channels. And uh, with this 2D to 1D separable convolution, um, even in a three by three, Instead of one, um, instead of full kernel, you obviously save about an 80, 90% of the parameters and your expressive power is still good. So yeah, we have whatever, I think 18 double convolution blocks so it's 36 layers. It's a pretty deep beast and it drains a while, but um, surprisingly, so you, on the left, you see the image again, just printed as in three colors, not all 12. We use 12 channels of the 13. And then you have the ground truth. So that is high quality LIDAR data. And then next to it, you have what our model predicts by looking only at the image on the left. So quite surprisingly, it can somehow guess how high the trees are. It does see more than us because it has the infrared response, which uh, trees have a very strong infrared response and uh, it has more channels. and but it, uh, still, it, I found it quite impressive. You do see, for example, in the second row that there is a certain amount of oversmoothing. That is the price to pay for the big context, right? If you learn to integrate information over a big context, then that's basically like a smoothing filter. The context will not change much if you move on a little bit. So you have the tendency to smooth things out. And uh, you, the structures are still there, but they're slightly smooth. Yeah, to, to give you some numerical results, depending on where we are, um, you get a median height error on the order of four to five meters if you go to the tropical rainforest in Gabon. Gabon is our favorite example. That's where these rainforest pictures are from because Gabon is a very impressive country in terms of trees. Like 90% of the country has more, has more than, is covered by more than 15 meter high vegetation. And so it has a lot of trees. So. We have done a fun calculation that if you stack all the trees of Gabon on top of each other, you're about more than 200 times the distance to the moon. And so it's an extreme case in one direction. Our second example is Switzerland, um, mainly for two reasons, because we're at home there, so people like to see it. And the other thing is that we have very good reference data because Switzerland is a country with a very proud surveying tradition. So they actually do very good vegetation maps and we have reference data everywhere that is pretty good. On the left, you see sort of our correlations between what we predict and the ground truth. In the top in Gabon, you actually see a bit of a saturation effect. So at the top, the curve veers a bit away from the diagonal and tends to fall down, which means there's a saturation effect. We, we can never predict more than about 55 meters. The network just gives up and thinks it can't be anything higher. And that's unfortunately not quite true. There are trees up to 70 something meters in Gabon, but uh, they're not strong enough or the signal is not discriminative enough to tell them from the slightly lower ones. We're pretty good with that. Actually, most other models that I know of are, are saturate more at the 20, 25-ish meter level. 
so yeah, we ran it for whole countries. Again, lots of pixels, of course. So this is Gabon on the left uh, with a zoom in. On the right is the, the previous map that existed that, in all honesty, it is a lot coarser because it was done from a coarser satellite. So there we had an advantage in terms of input technology. Um, it was also done without nice context modeling. And um, while it's not completely bad, I think one can see that it's also not really good. For Switzerland, it's actually worse. So the left one is, is what we create and it looks pretty good compared to reference data. The right one is what you could get before from NASA, from the American Space Agency. And we don't actually know why it's so completely wrong. Um, we are guessing that it is an effect of using radar data in the process of creating it. And radar is quite strongly affected by steep slopes. So if the algorithm is not adapted to mountain terrain, but made for flat areas, then it will give really, really uh, bad outliers and wrong measurements. But we don't know what basically the Swiss map that was there before was unusable. So we're quite happy with ours. Um, looking back a bit at the machine learning, uh, trying to analyze and not just blindly apply, where's the relation? And this is one of those cases where it's magic. We don't know. We can guess, we can speculate. So yes, the photosynthetic activity of trees influences their near-infrared reflectance. If the trees um, are healthy, work a lot, and um, have enough water in the leaves, their infrared reflectance is very big, and their green goes down, uh, the red goes down because they actually absorb red light. That's why they're green. Um, it can be the species composition. So possibly the spectral uh, signal of a neighborhood tells us what sort of trees these are. And of course, there's a correlation between the type of tree and how high it typically grows. Um, it could also be some shadowing and shading patterns. So if in the rainforest, there is this typical pattern of the super high trees sticking out even over the canopy and throwing a shade down, this will make a systematic radiometric pattern that might be influencing it. But we don't really know what's going on, to be honest. Um, we, you don't see any individual tree in that data you, because it's too, the pixels are too big. So we cannot really say where we get our signal from. But it works. It works really well, also with other satellites. So it's not uh, that I have a similar characteristics. And this is one of those typical prediction cases. So it's true that we haven't learned a lot about canopy height and reflectance and so on. But it's at the moment the only way to make large scale maps about that. I don't know of any other technology that can do it densely at good resolution. Having said that, uh, let's look a bit further into trees. We like trees, as you see. So there is a way of measuring directly, as I said, and that's laser scanning. So you shoot a laser pulse and you measure how long it takes to return. And that laser pulse is short, you know, if you can think about it, but if that laser pulse is relatively short, then if you can digitize every nanosecond, then you still get a, de a decent resolution uh, in spite of the light being very fast and you can measure this. And people have built such an instrument. It's uh, called JEDI, stands something for, I don't know what, global something in biodiversity investigation or so. And um, that is a big laser scanner that is mounted on the International Space Station, as in the picture on the right. It's actually still there. Luckily, I think the JEDI mission has been even extended because due to COVID delays, some other instrument has not gone there that would need the space. And it measures straight down. So this cannot be tilted and moved. This just looks vertically down on the earth and makes these stripes. It makes a few stripes. Actually, the laser beam is split into a few, but nevertheless, it makes sparse stripes. And this one is very sparse, but is nicely distributed. You get it everywhere on earth, well, not everywhere. You get it everywhere where the ISS passes, which is bad, for, bad news for Russia because the ISS turns back at about 51.6 degrees of latitude. So it doesn't go to Siberia. Um, and now we have these opposing things. We have JEDI, which is well distributed everywhere, but it's sparse. And we have the satellite, which is everywhere, but we need ground truth. And we try to combine those. We first start with the JEDI. So this gives you 1D profiles. This is, as I said, you get a digitized waveform of the responses, the echoes from the anything that is hit by this laser beam. And the footprint of that laser beam like one beam on Earth is actually 25 meters diameter. It's just because of the big distance. So it has a small beam divergence. It's not perfectly parallel and therefore it just gets to that size because you have to shoot out enough power. And then you get these patterns on the right. You see them on the surface of the Earth. At the bottom, you see how they look in a map. So 
They are basically striped scans. Each of those consists of individual dots that have a spacing of a few hundred meters or so. You don't see that in this plot. And these waveforms, they look like on the left. So it's literally a digitized waveform of signal intensity. And then you have to look at this and find out where's the canopy top and where's the ground response. And this is again a signal processing problem, one where you could of course apply a simple threshold, but that doesn't work all that well. Um, there are some algorithms that were hand engineered, um, but we found them to not deliver quite the accuracy that we were hoping for. So uh, we teamed up with the people from NASA and Maryland and made our own, which is essentially the same learning engine in 1D. So you build a 1D convolutional network. Again, it's a perfectly convolutional signal, right? If you send it a bit later, then you will get the same thing just shifted. And we run a 1D CNN that should regress directly what is the height of the canopy. Um, little thing here, I haven't mentioned it in the previous, we also have done it in the previous one, is that we like to have uncertainties. We like to be able to quantify how sure or unsure we are. So um, we go a little bit beyond straight regression and we usually use some sort of a maximum likelihood loss where um, it looks like the equation here. So for those who are familiar with simple statistical equations, it's no big magic. You have a normal residual again. So you minimize the distance between what is predicted and what should be there, but you scale it by some standard deviation. So it says if you're very unsure, then it's fine if you're a bit further away. So relative to the standard deviation, how bad are you? And in order to avoid that this thing then trivially goes to zero by making huge standard deviations everywhere, you regularize by also having the standard deviation in there and penalizing that getting big. And this thing actually can be derived very easily from the, from the normal Gaussian normal distribution. So it's, it's no big magic. And with this, we can estimate the sigma. So we get an estimate. We output not only the answer, but we also output the error bar, the sigma. Um, uh, statistically, it would be the aleatoric uncertainty. So that's uncertainty that comes from the data, from influences that are really beyond your control, variations, random variations in the data that just add up to some noise. And then there is a second part, um, which is the so-called epistemic uncertainty. So that's the model uncertainty. Now, in, in a normal analytical model, you say the model has a bias. Something is not modeled, the term is missing, so the model is biased. Now, a machine learning model with huge capacity to be flexible to fit everything actually has, cannot have a bias because it has got enough parameters. But there, the problem comes from the data. If it has not seen enough data, the data it has looked at has a bias then it learns to also output biased answers. So the model basically doesn't know what the answer is because it hasn't seen representative patterns. That's the epistemic uncertainty that actually goes down with more data, obviously, because eventually you fill in the blanks and that has to be estimated separately. And that cannot be estimated in some analytical way very well. So this has to go through some sort of Monte Carlo procedure. Either you just train decorrelated ensembles with random initialization that works best in our view, um, or in our experience. There are people who try to speed this up with you know, tricky putting the sampling somewhere else, like for example, Monte Carlo uh, batch norm or, or dropout and so on at inference time. Um, usually these are a bit less decorrelated, but they also work reasonably well. So together you actually estimate the model uncertainty and the data-driven aleatoric uncertainty, and that will then give you an estimate for your error bar for how sure you can be of the prediction. Importantly, this is trained just without having supervision for it, okay? You make a parametric assumption, you make this sort of, in the, in the end, second order statistical assumption that you just need one number, a sort of spread, a second moment to describe the distribution. You say, okay, then it's approximately Gaussian because of the central limit theorem, but who cares? But anyway, you can estimate this without having supervision because that would be impossible. While it would be trivial to regress two numbers, you don't have regression targets. You don't know what the uncertainty somewhere is. You cannot give it the true uncertainties to train it. So you have to work around a bit. Good, so if you do that for all Jedi, and here we've just you know done that for all the Jedi shots and then uh, aggregated that on a, on a half degree resolution, then you get this map of the tree height. Um, as you see, unfortunately, uh, much of where you are is not in there and the Canadians have the same problem. We will have to fill that in. There is a satellite that goes over the poles with a LIDAR. It's called ICESat, but it's a different thing that needs to be calibrated separately and so on. So we haven't yet gotten there. Good. So now we have a global tree height, but at a very coarse resolution. 
it's actually quite accurate. Again, we can go at those calibration sites where people have measured with LiDAR on the ground and we can compare it for different continents and um, it correlates reasonably well. What's more, here's a first simple but useful application of the uncertainty. We can actually threshold that. If the uncertainty is correctly calibrated, then if you throw out the 20% or 30% most uncertain predictions, then you should actually get more accurate, right? You, you live with a little bit less predictions, but take the more reliable ones, and that should push down the error because the unreliable ones should have bigger error on average. And that actually works. So here you see it. The error goes down by a good meter. If you are prepared to sacrifice 30% of your predictions. So you basically know which ones to mistrust and not look at. Good. Now, of course, in progress, I can't yet report the final result. You can combine these two things. So you use the JEDI, as you evaluate the JEDI, which gives you these coarse footprints bars. You use those as training points, train to infer, to predict from the satellite imagery. Uh, so here you see how sparse these JEDIs are if you really plot them in the middle row. But you take the little patches around them, you learn inference for those, and go worldwide. This means, uh, as the calculation at the bottom shows, um, you have to visit not with the neural network, but at least to check whether they're cloudy and you should put them, feed them in there and so on. You have to visit on the order of 10 to the 13th or a bit more pixels, so it takes a while. Luckily, we have big servers nowadays in Amazon or wherever, and then you can. Here's the first part that we've done, again, Indonesia, to combine it with the palm oil um, and gives reasonable predictions as far as we know. We're lucky again here in the north. Somebody has done a LiDAR campaign that is not in our data, so we can use it for validation. Good, so that's tree height. Maybe any questions so far that uh, that we should answer before we change topic? Mm, but, uh, oh, I, I had small question. I yes. had small question about uh, this elevation models, but uh, models of uh, canopy trees. Mm -hmm. And um, um, Maybe it's possible to use some uh, digital elevation model to improve prediction or no, because it's a simple idea for me. Maybe it's a wrong idea. We have, thought about, we have actually done some experiments in Switzerland where we do feed a digital elevation model. Um, we didn't see a big improvement. Mm -hmm. Somewhat surprisingly, I would have thought that it recognizes that the vegetation in the mountains somehow is different, but we didn't see a big difference there. A digital elevation model is absolutely mandatory if you want to do it with radar, because radar response, you know, as a range reflectance that's not well directed as a SAR will be completely messed up by, by different slope. But uh, with ours, we did try. Oh, I get a question. Did anybody ask yet about government clearance on getting satellite data? Now for these satellites, that's not a problem. These are satellites that are actually publicly sharing all their data. So this is paid by tax money from all the Europeans. I'm not, not sure, I think Russia has its own space program, so it's not a member of the ESA, but this is an ESA operated satellite in the Copernicus program, and they have an open data policy. So these images are literally dumped on a public server where you can download. The download is slightly cumbersome, but um, it is also uh, actually distributed over many open engines. So you can even download it from Google Earth Engine because they have an automatic bot that sucks all the Sentinel images down from the Space Hub and puts it into the Google Earth Engine. Um, so do we, do we develop some new techniques as well? In this one here, um, there weren't many new techniques. You will see that in the next example, we do develop new techniques if we need to. So maybe let's move to the next one, unless there's another question. Okay, so crop type mapping. Crop types, so you want to do the agricultural crops, you want to know what is growing there, maize or, or whatever, beetroots or so on. And you want to do that every pixel or in every field, you can just aggregate it to fields if you have boundaries. And there, you suddenly now get into time series of images, because what's characteristic to tell this is one crop and not the other, is actually um, the growth cycle. So it's not the individual color, that could be many things. Often it's very ambiguous, but the way that some things grow earlier and some grow later, and some cover the ground faster because they've brought leaves and otherwise are high stalks and so on. So this evolution over time is actually the main signal to find out what is there. 
And this evolution over time is also quite disturbed, as you see in these chips at the bottom, because unfortunately, uh, it's in the optical range that we have clouds and the satellites are above the clouds. So if there's cloud cover, they see white, which is not particularly useful. And there, um, this is another mapping problem that uh, has fairly obvious environmental applications. And then there's another issue uh, with this here, which you'll see also in other domains. Here it's very strong, and that is the imbalanced class distribution. So at the top, I have the distribution of the classes uh, that we use there in the Swiss categories from the Swiss uh, federal office. And there is one super dominant class, which are actually meadows. Uh, and then there are a few also quite dominant classes with uh, thousands or millions of samples. And then there is a long tail at the right that you actually don't see. Therefore, I put a log plot underneath so that you see that it's not zero, but it is very, very low. And this, of course, means that you have somehow have to find a scheme to um, share knowledge. Because even if you reweight, you can, of course, say, I just reweight every sample somehow by frequency in the hope that then the rarer ones will have more impact on the loss function and will bias your thing to also work. But it doesn't because you have too few samples. You're always seeing the same ones because you just oversample them. So, what else could be done? Some feature sharing. Um, so, these labels that you're predicting, these types of crops, they're not completely unstructured. They're not a linear list, but they actually have some hierarchical structure. So there are things that are broadly the same. You can think that, you know, apple and pear trees are obviously more similar than cornfields and so on. And there is actually such a hierarchy that is plotted here. It's not complete, but in the end, it's sort of a tree structured hierarchy, in this case with three labels. And that suggests that you could actually use that hierarchy, right? You could give the rare ones statistical strength by pooling them together and at least at a coarser level, learning something that they have in common so that they can don't fight against the big dominant class is better. And you can also output level uh, labels at different levels, which has the advantage that if you're super unsure or you can't resolve the finest one, you can maybe still get the next course a level and that might for some aggregate statistics or for subsidies actually often be also useful information. So we try to exploit this and the time series and the images. So now comes the combination. There are images, so it should be convolutional. There are time series, so it should be recurrent. And there is a hierarchy, so you need multiple levels. First of all, because the convolution only works if you have it a certain degree of abstraction. So if you give it a bit of depth, and the other thing is you have to look, you have to work at different levels because the granularity, the number of labels, and therefore also the number of the outputs and so on is actually different. And so we constructed a network that does all of that. So what you see here is a sort of a sketch at the bottom, you feed the images. This goes through some convolutional branch to a level one where you have a latent encoding um, at a low with a low label resolution supervised on the right. So it is a time series of images and the recurrent network gets a convolutional feature map as a hidden state inside. But, and from that, you wanna predict a map of the course classes. And then you go further, you process those features further at the next level, you have the finer classes and the even next level, you have the even finer classes as supervision. And all that hangs together. So there are connections in the horizontal and in the vertical way. And there's a structure on those labels. And in the end, you concat everything and you predict everything and you hope it works. So that is the structure. So this is at the same time, this is combining convolution with recurrence in an interleaved way. It's not just, what people often do is they build a convolutional pyramid and then they say, okay, at the top, now I have my high level features and those form a time series. But then you don't have the connections over time at the lower levels. And this actually works well. It's known that you need a certain depth for, for convolution to work. But unfortunately, there's an issue that if you try that with a standard recurrent cell, it will become very unstable. So if you take the gold standard, so either LSTM or GRU are usually the ones that you that you would go to, right? Then they have an issue that if you stack them on top of each other, they don't train anymore. And so we came up with our, our own cell, which is actually a simplified version. You see the diagram here at the bottom, we call it star, like stackable recurrent. And that has actually a simpler structure 
but it has the advantage that if you analyze the gradient flow in it, you see that it doesn't amplify or attenuate the gradients on average. Um, if you look at the others, um, so here, sorry, this is a bit difficult to explain, but at the, at the top, what these diagrams show is from left to right is the time. So this is as you go through the sequence and add additional data points, in our case, images. And in the vertical direction is the depth of the network, so the layers that you stack. And if you do this with a standard RNN, which are known to have a problem, then the gradients just tend to explode. So you go further back and it gets redder and redder, so the gradient magnitude blows up. And then people say, well, we have to build in these gates to regulate that, and you tend to do an LSTM, and there the gradients tend to flow well along one level in time. So they are good in remembering further back, but if you go across layers, and you can analyze that mathematically um, with some approximations and see that it makes sense, then you actually, with every level, you have an attenuation of the gradient, so they basically vanish, and then you don't learn anything at the lower levels. And so with ours, this behavior is uh, not perfect, but a lot less regular, as you see on the right. So everything is around the yellow orange orangish range, which uh, is where you want it to be, right, around one. If the factor that attenuates, so makes the gradient stronger or weaker is around one, then the gradients are preserved without exploding or vanishing after a few uh, steps. So it works a lot better with stacking. We've verified that not only for agriculture, by the way, if you look into this uh, PAMI paper, there are experiments with uh, synthetic data sets, with gesture recognition, with music, and with a lot of other things, I think 10 or 11 different data sets. So if you need to stack, uh, recurrent cells, then this really works quite a lot better. And it's actually also more parameter efficient. It has fewer gating variables, so you save yourself half of the parameters compared to an LSTM. It also trains faster because of that, by the way. So we find at least that uh, for, for this task, it works quite a bit better. And so we then combine, take this as a recurrent unit um, with a convolutional hidden, so with an image level hidden layer that can link, be linked with convolutions to, to neighboring levels and with this hierarchical um, supervision. And then we do the crop mapping. Again, you can of course run this for large scale and then see how you perform. And here you have a table, for example. Uh, so other people have also tried to solve this problem and um, if you look at the far right, so at the accuracy number, this is just total percentage of correct pixels, everything seems fine, right? The others, everybody is good. There's not a big difference. But the reason for that is exactly the imbalanced class distribution. So basically, if you always predict the two or three frequent classes, then you get most of the pixels right. And for the not so frequent classes, all the pixels are wrong, but it doesn't hit in this aggregate statistics. And that's a bad thing because the rarer classes are often the important ones. You know, those crops are a lot more valuable than grass. So um, you don't want to make so big mistakes there. Sorry, there is a short question uh, in the yeah. chat. Uh, could you please explain what minus one stands for in the uh, star layer scheme? Um, where is the minus one? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Here we just have one, two, three. The minus one? Uh, the, yeah, here, exactly. Mine. Okay, so you... You feed in the hidden state, you feed in two hidden states in the unit. One comes from the previous lower layer, so that's the vertical direction of the diagram, and one comes from the previous time step, so that's the horizontal direction, and one of them is inverted. So there is this joint sigma parameter, but in one of them you have a minus one. So um, that's just uh, combining those two things. And then inside there's the, a K, so these are the learned parameters. Um, I think it goes too far to completely um, detail that thing, but uh, if you look into the paper, we actually, you know, we, are, we don't only make graphics, obviously. There are actually step-by-step -step equations for the recurrence relation in there. I just find it, uh, maybe for mathematicians that would actually be in order, but I find it very hard to present equations with three indices in a talk, so I tend not to show them, but they are there. Okay, so, so to come back to this, as I said, the accuracy looks good, but if you look at a more specific thing, like the average of one score, so where every class actually has a say, then you see that the improvements are, are actually quite significant. You get uh, 
up by, you know, from 42 as the best competition to 52, or in general, you gain more than 10% points on precision and recall per class. So this, of course, manifests itself. So if you look at a confusion matrix, on the left uh, is a confusion matrix. So dark green, 100% means 100% correct on the diagonal, and 100% off the diagonal, like in the left corner is bad, means 100% incorrect. You confuse one class for the other. So the confusion matrix of ours is the one on the left. For the very, very rare classes, it still doesn't work, as you see. But the next one, the right plot, actually shows you the relative differences against the fair baseline if you use the, these uh, imbalanced uh, hierarchical class scheme. And you see that in the middle. So for those which are not super frequent, but already reasonably rare, but they still have enough data to learn at all, you get green. And green means better on the diagonal, and green means worse off the diagonal, because green means the number goes up. Brown off the diagonal is good, because it means the confusion between two classes goes down. And you see that there is a reasonably good improvement, sometimes up to more than 40% points. The very last ones on the right, we still fail. Um, these are extreme examples. This is just because we refrain from data set engineering. Um, if you want to hear the most extreme, the very right column, that's chestnut plantations. And there is one in the whole data set with 11 pixels, and it's in one of the five cross-validation stripes. So no matter how you run, it's either not in training or not in test, and you have no chance to ever get it right. But uh, we didn't bother to remove it. Um, it also helps that you can actually try to, you know, how many how many pixels can you predict with a certain accuracy? If you demand a certain accuracy, that's how you would then evaluate for an operational application where people have a specified accuracy. And um, on that one, it actually also gets a lot better, especially if you have the many le levels so that you can cut off and say, if I'm unsure, I just only give you the coarser classification and say, you have to fix it by hand because the engine can't do it. Okay. I'll speed a bit up. There are some examples which are not so interesting, so I'll quickly step through them. This is super standard computer vision just applied to environmental problems. So basically detect objects and classify images, just retrained. So um, large scale for doing different tree types in the city. Um, so if you have a huge city like Los Angeles with a million trees, it's actually important to know which trees, um, also what their health status. And there we did some applications from directly street panoramas. We use Google Street View. This is no longer allowed. And if you look into the use into the use conditions for Google Street View, there now is a sentence that says you're not allowed to do further mapping products, like for example, extracting trees. So I'm afraid they picked up on our work and said this is not what they want. Which is why the mayor of Los Angeles cannot use it, although we gave it to him. Um, but it works reasonably well. Um, and you can then again, of course, regress more interesting environmental stuff like the tree stress level. So how, how healthy or how dead is the tree? One is dead, zero is good in, in this uh, scheme. And um, there are experts who can label this in pictures or you can measure this with the more objective ways. And um, the correlation is again, very good. So it's something that uh, CNN can learn. It's individual information apparently. And the same for field plots, where foresters go to revisit those plots, you can also do the same thing. And uh, actually, you see that the different, depending on how you tune exactly your network, you get all those colorful curves. And if you ask five domain experts who do this every year to do it independently and then um, take their average, and then you look at the accuracy is how far, um, how, how good do they agree? So how many mistakes are there among the expert classification? You see that they are also not completely sure. But let's skip this. Maybe a more interesting one that I like that is also, again, um, useful in terms of technology, grain size distribution in riverbeds. So for people who are in hydrology, and um, it's important to know what is the distribution of the sizes of the little pebbles that make up the riverbed that influences ecological parameters. You need certain sizes, for example, for the fish to be able to spawn and reproduce. In Switzerland, in some rivers, they even throw in artificial new gravel to replenish it so that the fish have enough uh, spawning grounds. And it can be important for floods, uh, like you know the friction of the riverbed and things like that. So the way that they measure this in operational practice is like this. You go out in the field, you lay out a string or a measure tape, and you look at all the stones, and you measure their size. So um, you can imagine that doesn't scale all that well. Okay, so they were clever. They said, we're going to do a digital way of measuring that. We take a drone, we take pictures, 
And then we make a software that draws us this measuring string, and then we draw the bounding boxes on the screen so that we don't have to stay out in the cold riverbed all day. Um, scales a little bit better, but you know it's not really automation. So we thought, let's go a step further. This was a, a collaboration with a company that does these things, actually. And we said, let's predict this automatically. Again, just brute force. You put in an image, and what you spit out is actually a histogram or multiple the different quantities. They want the histogram, but they also want derived quantities from the histogram, you know, some characteristic diameters and so on. So we got to convince them, although this is, of course, for people who have the understanding hard to, to swallow in the beginning, that they should not try to detect the individual stones and um, then, you know, do the statistics from that, but that you follow this machine learning principle to really only infer what you also want to know as direct as possible so you don't lose anything along the way, you don't make your problem harder to solve a simpler problem. And so we directly regress those histogram distributions. Obviously, that means that you have to use a, a decent loss function. So you need a loss function that can compare histogram distributions and tell you how good or bad they match. Um, in principle, for these histograms here, the technical correct thing would actually to use a Wasserstein loss, like in Wasserstein gun similar, so basically an earth mover's distance that tells you how much probability mass do you have to shift to turn one into the other. This makes sense because the distribution is actually ordered. It's a sort of yeah, discretized version of a, of a continuous distribution that's just binned into discrete bins. So there's an order. Making an error to the next bin is not as bad as going 10 bins wrong. So you should use this earth mover's distance, this Wasserstein measure. But uh, the reality is it makes no difference. You can just put in a KL divergence, which doesn't matter whether you're 10 bins wrong or just one with the same probability mass, but it works almost equally well. Actually, it works equally well. And so we predict these histograms. Um, an often overlooked question is, what is the gold standard? So how good are people at it? People think we can do this better. Um, for cats versus dogs, this is certainly true. You all know that if people say that there's a superhuman perform performance on ImageNet that is actually cheating, that's not because their network is really seeing better than humans. The network is seeing worse than humans when it comes to things we know, like cars from trucks or so. But the network is very good at being an expert in multiple domains at the same time. And in ImageNet, there are about 25 dog species and about 30 different types of mushrooms. And that is something the network can learn very well. It doesn't care. Whereas there are a few humans who at the same time are experts in dog species and mushrooms. So that's how you get superhuman performance. Um, anyway, for this one here, I feel that we are actually at human performance because comparing grain size distributions and saying which one is better um, or even marking individual grains is something where people have a large variability. Here at the bottom, there are six grain size distributions for this image that you see. One of them is by a convolutional network. Five of them are by independent experts. So who can guess which one is by the network? You can probably know it's not even the smoothest one. It's actually this one. So um, it's the sort of experiments that you need to convince people who are not machine learners that the predictions are useful. And that, of course, again, gives you the big advantage that you can just scale it. It's computational, it's just CPU power and not manpower and people's time. And therefore, you can now suddenly make a map of this grain size or of some statistics of it over a complete gravel bar in a river and not just at 10 little sites. You don't have to interpolate blindly, but you suddenly have a tool that can actually use observations to do it right. Okay. Shall I stop here or continue? Or... Uh... You have, I think, four more minutes because we started later, so as you wish. How big was the training data for the stones? Um, so yes, we did have the experts annotated. They had to do it anyway because it's their professional practice, right? I mean, they, they need this to deliver it to their clients, but they were nice enough to share it with us. That's also the reason why this is, I think, the only data set in this talk that we are not sharing. We can't because it belongs to a company and has a commercial value because they sat down and spent their working time to make it. So they didn't give us the data set. We only published the network. Um, in this case here, we didn't use any task specific augmentations. We used standard augmentations, of course, like you know, rotating stuff and so on. But um, and um, how big was the training set? I actually don't remember how many, but we have 
the bar it's it's not a very big training set you need to augment quite a bit because yeah again you're dependent on the labels so we have about i think 13 rivers and on each bar don't know how many we have but it's, it's several hundreds it's not thousands of examples unfortunately it would be nice but this is something that is often overlooked um deep learning got big with problems that are deep learning friendly, mostly because they come either from internet companies. So people like Google or Yandex obviously have essentially infinite number of training data because the whole internet belongs to them for looking for data and getting annotations from people. And people like automotive companies can afford to have millions, and this is literally millions of traffic signs labeled by hand because there's so much value in it. But in many environmental problems, it is either unpayable or nigh impossible to get annotations. I mean, you cannot go out in the field and measure the tree height for a, or more complex things like the vegetation biomass or something for thousands and thousands and thousands of pixels because you, there is no measurement device that can do it efficiently. So we have to live with smaller training data. Actually, that brings me to that last example, which I also want to just quickly mention, uh, which is lake ice. So lake ice is an essentially climate variable. The question is basically when and how long is a lake frozen and where? So you can see just a semantic segmentation of some satellite time series, and then you can derive everything. Um, now, the problem is you need this with high coverage every day. So um, most data sources fall out. There are two that we found. One of them are satellites which have a very low resolution, but uh, they take a picture of the same place every day or multiple pictures but the pixel size then goes up 250 meters, 500 meters. Or another way, if you're lucky and the lake has some touristic value or lots of people living there, there might be a webcam that looks on the lake, at least on parts of it. And that's the things that we try. Again, the satellite images are affected by clouds, the webcams are not, but the satellite images are consistent and show everything, the webcams don't. And they have huge perspective distortion, so the image scale gets different and so on. But anyway, you do what you can. Um, so for the satellites, you have very few pixels. That's just so. The size of our lakes in the mountains are small. We don't have the lakes that you have. We have small little lakes that freeze. And their deep learning was just not an option. You could never assemble that data. So we had to go back to the super old boring support vector machine. You can, of course, take whatever XG boost or random forest if you prefer, but you have to take some simple engine. On the other hand, it's good because the spatial correlation doesn't matter, right? If the pixel is 500 meters or 250 meters, then the pixel is three, one three pixels further doesn't really influence you. It doesn't interest you. So you don't need to amass a huge amount of context. And so the good old learning still has its place. Um, you can just do a standard application there. So nothing special, but it can be solved to very high accuracy. So this is the reminder that deep learning is super cool but only if you get the advantages, right? If there are complex correlations where you need all those connections and all those huge receptive fields and so on, or even complete connections like MLP style, otherwise you just buy parameters that don't help you. So having a too complex function, even if it's well regularized, can nevertheless be an overkill. For the webcams, of course, it's completely different. I mean, this is an image segmentation problem. You have no idea what the patterns are. It's completely non-analytical and um, has a huge variability in each class. So of course you should use something cleverer. In this case, some uh, more or less standard uh, semantic segmentation network. Again, you should be clever, add enough skip connections to not lose your high resolution info and so on. So, um, and then, that is actually used so you can do some things like analyze the trends of the lake ice i mean you will not be surprised given uh, climate change that the lake ice trend in switzerland over the last 20 years is actually that it's getting less so the number of days that the lakes are frozen has a trend down by something like half a day per year and uh, i guess that's not different in most other parts of the of the northern hemisphere where most of the frozen lakes are so you can then correlate that with different climate variables, with the sunshine duration and with average accumulated temperature and so on. And that is then of interest um, for people to have local climate information that is not just global at the you know, two and a half kilometer or 10 kilometer global model scale. Okay, 
So after this grand tour, let me finish with an old uh, quote that I still like about machine learning um, from the great Vladimir Vatnik, of course, if the talk is in Russia, um, who said that, um, there, who, who drew this, you know, philosophical further connection that there is something drastic and not just engineering, happen better engineering and machine learning, because it goes against the thinking that good models are simple. It basically says there are good decision rules that cannot be made simple with few parameters, but, and when the world, in those situations where the world is complicated, we have to basically throw away explainability to make good predictions. If we want to make good predictions, the models will probably inherently not be, you know, understandable as in explainable AI and the other way around, if uh, the models are understandable and easy for humans to manipulate, which means they're low dimensional, they might not be able to make good predictions ever. Now, this is a contentious standpoint, but I somehow sympathize with it. You might be right. <laughs>